I'm Mickey Pellerano, and this is Time Lord TV, the show where we talk about astrology, occultism, and how they interface with art and culture. We are back, and today we've got a very special guest, my friend Nika, also known as Zola Jesus, and she's here with us to relaunch our show as still a YouTube show, but also a podcast format. And as usual, you can visit our Patreon at patreon.com slash TV for astrological elections and forecasts and ritual guides. And I want to thank all of our patrons right now. Thanks so much for being a part of this and making this possible and this relaunch possible. And Nika, in fact, you are a patron, so I can thank you in person and say thanks very much. Oh, it's a it's a pleasure. I'm so glad that you started that Patreon for for fans like us out there. Likewise, I've always been a fan and a friend. Nika and I met probably uh, 14 years ago or something, right? Something like that. I was that. in college. Yeah, you slept in my house, right? I in did. Madison? Yeah, I slept at your house in Madison. Uh, my band was touring with your band on Sacred Bones, or the band I was in, Cult of Youth. And uh, yeah, we we toured together, and that's where we first met. And uh, we've we've stayed on the path, right? And been there. It's it's super exciting to have you because you know, Time Lord TV is really about how magic and occultism are not some outre uh you know esoteric concealed thing right that that magic and occultism are interwoven into art and culture they, they always have been right they've always drank from the same fountain and uh if this show has an ethos or a true purpose it is to demonstrate that right and demonstrate how that is very much alive and has always been so you're the ideal guest in a sense, uh, because, you know, we always have a musical guest. We always have a, uh, an occultist guest, but you are both. So, uh, can you tell us a little bit about how, um, magical practice and mysticism in general, um, how that interacts and interfaces with your process as an artist and your creativity? Oh, it's such a deep question that is actually kind of hard to answer because it's something that is so into it's such an intuitive part of my practice. Um, I mean, on uh, the creative end, I think having a connection. Well, I'll say that creativity is by nature a mystical process. And so um, I learned that from a very early age. But once I realized what mysticism means in not only a spiritual term but also like an occultic term it made so much sense to why i'm driven to create the things that i um the awareness that comes from creating um and as i've gotten deeper into a spiritual practice that idea of mysticism or that idea of having an experiential relationship to the divine is um kind of like paramount in my life, not only in my creative work, but in how I navigate the world, how I navigate my career, how I navigate my personal relationships, how I navigate my relationship to myself, inner growth. It's just, it's everything. It's foundational to my life. Um, and that it, it, that presents itself in a myriad, myriad of ways, but um, we, which we can get to. But yeah, it's it's just deep. It's life, you know? It's it's life to say it very uh, generically. <laughs> I I couldn't agree more. Uh, one of my favorite quotes by, uh, uh, you know, I'm not a fellow my by any means, but the quote by Alistair Crowley is is uh, it, it, people ask him why should I study magic? He says, "Well, you're already doing it. You might as well do it properly, mm -hmm. right?" Uh, it's something yeah. that is 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 part of who we are. So let me even address the first part of your response of how you uh, describe creativity as a, a mystical phenomenon or experience in the first place. I agree with you. Can you elaborate a little bit on that and your feeling and experience around it? So creativity is such an incredible gift that we have as humans, and it's something that I take so seriously as to devote my life to it. Um, and that that is the nature of giving birth to things that have no source, you know? And um, 
you can't really necessarily control the outcome of what is created, but it's a process of bringing it out through through you and through one's voice, whatever instrument that is or whatever modality that is. And so um, for me, that experience has been fraught with, you know, either trying to people please or trying to emulate or imitate others. But as I've gotten older, I've really understood that the um, the power and the profundity of creating is that you are tapping into something that is not you and that comes through you. And so you can't lay claim to it, but you can bathe in the um, the experience of almost touching God through those moments. Um, and uh, that's what keeps me going. It's not the career. It's not the anything that has to do with the material aspects of being a musician. It's really to meet those moments time and again. And they don't always happen, but when they do, you go, oh, this is why I do this. It's, 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 it's emergence, you know? It's so hard to explain because it's such a f- strange phenomenon, but, um, but it's something that I've tried to define many times because it doesn't seem real when you get that close to touching the divine through um, one's work. Uh, that it it feels like, am I, am I lying to myself? Am I kidding myself? What I'm feeling right now? Where did that come from? You know. Um, but it's that's the magic. That's the magic. I mean, I think you did a beautiful job of describing it. Uh, recently, in my Jyotish studies uh, with Freedom Cole and uh, Param Guruji Sanjay Roth and. Uh, um, Eric Rosenbush, we've been learning about actually the process of creation itself. Like, how was the universe created? How did it come into being? And uh, my teacher says, in order to really understand yourself and other people, we need to understand how reality came into being in the first place, right? And so, um yeah which i think is a beautiful thing right and and it it totally it's it's that it, any creative act is in a sense a sacred act right how that all uh just like life itself is a sacred act and mm-hmm. in this principle so far derived from the vedas and also the lakshmi tantra there's like three layers uh in the material uh, sphere, right? In the world where where we have what is called an ahamkara, meaning an I sense, an ego sense of who we are, right? Transcendent of that is is absolute. And we all have part of us that is intrinsically part of that absolute, right? But in this incarnation, it's fragmented in a sense into an individual atma or soul, Right. And this is the, the, the top level of sanctity of us that is connected to divinity. And within that soul are the seeds of the desires of the soul. Uh, and there's a planet in your chart that describes the soul. Uh, we call it the Atmakarika. And your Atmakarika is the sun. And mine is also the sun. So, um, you know, the Atmakarka is the planet that describes the soul. It is, it is, uh, uh, leadership, uh, power, uh, demonstration, but also, uh, evaluation of ego, right? And, and, and of like, okay, right? Like, like arrogance, humility, right? This balance between the two and finding our space there of, of, of who the essence really is, right? And then on the second level, we have manas and manas is mind. It's kind of like, uh, most closely indicated by the moon in the chart actually, and the aspects from the moon. And so that aspect of mind, right? We've got, it's where we dream. It's where we think and imagine, right? It's that world where, you know, I say, uh, you know, imagine an apple in your hand. Now bite that apple. That it's not real. It's not material reality, but it's real in the mind, right? And then finally, we have the filter of those three executed through the ascendant, right? Through the uh, uh, human agency into the world of of 
what originated as soul seeds and then ended up as material reality that we brought into being or that we attracted to ourselves. Um, and it's so crazy, like, like to look at this creative process as, as like, uh, any act, right? Any act of will is a magical act. Any act of creation is a magical act, right? So, uh, it's beautiful how you describe that it's integrated into your, everything that you do, not just your creativity, but your relationships, your, uh, uh path of self-knowledge, the way that you navigate life in general. Um, what are some traditions and some um, paths that you've explored in this trajectory? Well, on a mundane level, I would say, you know, every single day I pull three tarot cards, past, present, future, and an extra um, toast deck. And that helps guide me where I, where I am. It helps me reflect on the past and, um, and also prepare for the future. So that's a, a mundane thing that I do every single day. Um, every single day, I take a a ritual a ritual bath with different levels of of you know ritualism or cleanliness ritual cleanliness. Um, but those things help ground me in my spiritual practice. Um, but on a deeper level, I am a practicing Buddhist. I um, there is a um, a Zen monastery a couple hours from where I live, which is one of the most special monasteries in the country. I think it's um, Rinzai lineage, um, and it's it's very traditional, and it's it's just provided me with a deeper um, lineage and um, kind of uh, deep sea of knowledge in which to kind of situate where I am in life and also to not get too big of a head with that sun. That airy sun keeps me a little humble. Um, that's why I like Buddhism. It reminds you that you're just dirt. Um, so that's been extremely important to me. I have, um, I meditate, I do Zazen, um, and uh, I have an altar, which um, I pay my respects to and which reminds me of my, um, ongoing uh, just path you know it's kind of like a poster for the path in a way as well as um, petitioning the gods um, so those things are just a part of my daily life that keep me keep me keep my my eyes open um, and then just on a creative level I've really had I've gone through the gamut of ambitions and reasons for doing what I do. But again, the older that I get, the more I see my creative practice and my music as a means of um, not only experiencing this kind of divinity through the music, but also being a bit of um, a bit of a, how do I say it? I don't know, to just communicate the things that I think that are really important for society right now. And I guess that sun leadership is definitely a part of how I navigate my uh, what I feel like my role is in, on this earth in this time. So um, I definitely try to use my my voice and use my platform to 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 um, yeah, just communicate and contribute these things that I find to be so important and that we're losing in our society and our, you know, in a very like spiritually vacant society, especially as I see so many people turn to social media and these kind of grifters, these snake oil salesmen that are trying to sell you manifestation magic and all of this stuff. It's like, I feel like more than ever, it's important to really um, be real and true to what the actual path is. And to spread that um, through my music and and everything. So I don't know if that answers your question, but that's about it. <laughs> no, I'm fully in agreement with that. And yeah, it is that yeah. Atmakarika sun, right? This demonstration of philosophy and what is important and all this uh, through what you do. And yeah, I would say you're not just dirt, Nika. You're also stardust, right? You're 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 yeah. infused with like divinity is is 
right? Uh, we are the eyes and ears and experience of of divinity here. And there's so many okay. things. It's, I want to get into the deities that that you uh, uh, propitiate, right? But first, Rinzai Buddhism is something I know very little about. Can you explain uh, some of its core tenets and its nature? Yeah, so there's um, two main schools of Zen Buddhism, and there's Soto and Rinzai. There are, you know, small differences between the two, but I would say the biggest difference is that um, Rinzai is much more um, rigorous. It's much more traditional, and it um, it uses um, uh, it, it just tends to use more. How do I explain it? Um, it tends to use Zazen in a more mi militaristic way. I mean, it was kind of like the warrior school. It was like the samurai school of Buddhism um, in Japan. And so whereas Soto was kind of the, um, the uh, pastoral farmer's Zen, you would go and you would sit and, you know, just by mere sitting, you may reach enlightenment, you may not. This is much more rigorous. They thwack you, you know, <laughs> they give you... Um, mantras and and things like that and they're more more into koans as well and so they're they're searching for that sudden, sudden enlightenment but then i also practice um or i'm beginning to practice this esoteric buddhist practice called shugendo which is a mix of shinto and um zen and a little bit of shingong um so shugendo is a mountain it's like a mountain monk type practice where um in the areas in Japan where they weren't allowed to practice uh, Buddhism because at some periods Buddhism was outlawed and you could only practice Shinto. Shinto married Zen in this Shugendo practice. So there are these magical places in the mountains where you would take these long hikes, fasted hikes, and um, you would perform rituals. One would perform rituals in the forests, in the mountains, and um, this would be to honor the deities of Buddhism but also to, um, you know, they, were, they also had like magical uses for oneself. So that's something I've been getting into. My monastery um, offers Shugendo training, which I have done a little bit of. And um, I participated in a, a ritual at this monastery, which is, it's called Karinji, if anyone wants to look it up. Um, it's, it's led by um, the abbot Mairoshi Maido Moore, who is an incredible um, uh, teacher of Rinzai Zen and Shugendo. But yeah, I participated in this ritual um, a while back at Karinji called Kechien Kanjo, which is an ancient ritual where you are cosmically linked with a Buddha. And of course, there are many Buddhas. Um, and I was linked with Amida Buddha, who is the main Buddha in Pure Land Buddhism, which I know very little about, but now I'm learning because Amida is my guy. Uh, and so Amida is a deity that I do um, display on my altar quite a bit and... Uh, and uh, seek, seek to seek, seek answers, seek strength, everything. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> it sounds almost tantric, this approach. Would it be appropriate to categorize this as tantric Buddhism? Um, it's not necessarily tantric, but it is closer to, I mean, it's an esoteric practice, so it's closer to something like maybe Tibetan. Um that's what Shingong is too. Shingong is like the Japanese Tibetan Buddhism, basically. Um, but there, there are, are a lot of durational things within this practice that could could be considered tantric for sure. And remind me, what yeah. was the name of this deity that you were linked with? Amida. Namu Amida Butsu. That's his mantra. <laughs> Amida, what's Amida? Yeah, what's the what are the nature and characteristics of this deity, Amita? Yeah, he's he's the Buddha of infinite uh compassion. So um I mean I I don't have an encyclopedic mind, but what I know is that he is a Buddha that um by worshiping him, you have access to enlightenment in a sense, which is not the same to be said for all Buddhas. This, and this is why in Pure Land Buddhism, which is a, a very popular school of Buddhism in Japan and elsewhere, um, Amida is the main deity. He's almost like a Jesus figure in, in Pure Land. 
So if you worship Amida, he almost provides you this uh, this enlightenment or this cosmic kind of um, promise to to reach enlightenment in a next life. And so he is the Buddha of infinite compassion, and I I got him. He's my guy. So, <laughs> but yeah, he's he's a beautiful one. Whoa! I wonder. I, I've got to take a quick look at your chart now because I'm like this. In in uh yeah. in Jyotish, we've got this concept called the uh the Ishta Devata, right? So you've got the Atmakarika, and then we have a chart called the Navamsha. With you, by the way, I'm oh, I'm yeah, working yeah. on t- tweaking your chart. One day I'll have to ask you some really specific questions about when certain that. yeah, when certain skills and abilities of yours arose and uh how they started to manifest. But I'm kind of on a tip already of 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 where your chart is. <laughs> But either way, whatever your ascendant is in the Navamsha or the D9, the ninth divisional chart, the house that is 12th from the Atmakarika in the D9 tells us what our Ishta Devata is. And this, similar to what you described, is the deity that uh, brings us enlightenment, right? In, in which we mm-hmm. find a transcendence of the samsara of this current incarnation. So I'm going to take a quick peek. I'll have to look. Yikes. I'll have to look more into uh, Amida and how this uh, uh, coalesces with Devatas in in Jyotish that would c- correspond to it. And I understand that you have, um, uh, besides your Buddhist practice, you also have uh, what I would call a bond or like a sambanda with. Um, uh, other deities, such as I know that astro- astrology and astrological magic is part of what you do, and particularly uh, Sekhmet as a uh, uh, deity from the Egyptian pantheon with whom you feel a certain uh, mm-hmm. proximity, right? Can you tell us a little bit about this? Yeah. So um, Sekhmet, uh, either I found her, she found me. I'm not really sure how that happens, but I was doing, I was in a period of deep journeying work, which is something. Most of my magical practice is journeying or, um, uh, you know, that kind of inner inner journeying work. Uh, who I, lo- I love Josephine, Josephine McCarthy, and I've taken some of her, her classes and read her books on um, active imagination or journeying or that inner, inner work. And in doing that, there was a period where I was doing that every day for like an hour, hour a day, two hours a day, whatever, just really trying to access these... Um, inner inner temples and palaces and and libraries and whatever and so i had a really profound experience one day where i had entered a uh, a cave and it, it kind of in the deep into the cave there was this throne and on the throne was this um deity with a, a lion's head and uh she said what are you doing here i said um, I mean, it was, you know, it's like a, it's a private, it, it's a, it was a personal experience, but I was like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. You know, classic, like, what am I, what am I doing here? I don't know. But um, I created kind of like a link with her then. And after that experience, Sekhmet kept appearing. The lust card, which I think um, you pulled for me years ago when you were doing a reading for me and said this was a very important card. I kept getting this lust card over and over, which to me felt like Sekhmet coming out. And, um, she became a, a totem and a deity for me to um, emerge from a really dark period where I felt very lost, very um, disempowered. And um, and since then, she has been this, um, you know, any of these uh, tendencies I have, the, the masculine, aggressive, warlord type tendencies I have within me as an Aries. <laughs> um, and, you know, albeit she is she, more of like a lion, but um, I... I f- feel them sort of exalted through her and I feel like I can channel those more aggressive intense energies through Sekhmet and so she has become a really important player on my altar and in my life yeah because in the tropical zodiac you have this Libra rising right that is so elegant and so musical and so uh diplomatic and <laughs> symmetrical but then you've got this exalted airy sun right all at the same <laughs> time right so these two i mean i wouldn't call them i wouldn't call that a disparity i would call that a uh 
I would call that a completion of both sides of the axis, right? Like the that warrior energy. Like you're so attracted to this right. kind of samurai uh, element of, of of Zen, and then at the same time, this this uh, 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 aesthetic elegance of Libra, right? And this and this peace and tranquility of Libra, uh, and how they have to coexist in this way. Uh, is journeying is that akin to like astral travel or? Um, so journeying, there's another name for it, which I've forgotten because I just haven't been reading about it as much as I was back then. But journeying is this thing where you go into your mind, you go into a deep, deep meditation to the point where everything falls away. And it and it could be also considered like Jungian active imagination where whatever kind of starts to bubble up is something that's coming either you know whatever lineage you want to think about it for this kind of magical lineage it's like a magical message or it's like you're able to access this this magical space within your own mind and i'm not a much of a ceremonial magician it's not something that's ever been um come came naturally to me but as a deep dreamer and like a meditative person the, the the journeying is the way that i'm able to access magical um either wisdom or to petition for things or to discover things um or to even just kind of play which probably isn't that that good <laughs> but yeah it's 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 uh it's kind of hard to explain but it's using one's own imagination to access kind of inner realms yeah like that's that's totally like when i was talking before about those three levels and how they're described in jyotish like that is the level of manas right that is the level of mind and the dream state and how it is an intermediary between the soul Uh. and the physical reality and and as we uh uh so in a sense it it, as you say, both of us, I think, are dealing with a lot of different traditions here and a lot of different uh, <laughs> languages, but it, you could correlate that to astral travel yeah. or a- astral activity, right? Because you're working in that intermediary dream state, that state of mind for both uh, playing, which I actually think is is lovely, right? The The Vedas mm-hmm. and the Tantras tell us that that the universe came into being as an act of lila, as an act of play, and and it's play in terms of, in the sense of the word is that you'd play a game, but it's also play in the sense of like, oh no, it's a play, it's a drama with a set and a costume and characters and all of this, right? Um, so I think it's beautiful that you're you're operating with it on that level and that you're having these. Um, you know, connections with uh, uh, archetypal, nothing wrong with that word, right? Deities such as, okay. as Sekhmet and, and the Lust card. I know you and I both are partial to the Thoth uh, deck when it comes to uh, tarot. I I mean, especially yeah. because, you know, my teacher, Austin Kopic, wrote this beautiful book, uh, 36 Faces, and it's about the decans of the Zodiac, right? The three... Mm-hmm. Um, 10 degree segments of every sign of the zodiac and how these demonstrate how each sign of the zodiac unfolds as a movie unfolds as a drama with three acts you know you've got like uh uh aries right the first act of aries is where you know rama gets his bow or or arthur pulls the sword from the stone you know this kind of like uh carving a place in the world kind of areas and then in the middle you get which i believe is where your son is correct what what degree is your natal son 22 i'm at 22 degrees so your son's at 22 degrees aries and that actually puts you in the third decan so the second decan of aries is this like all right that's where arthur becomes king right and he realized that the good of the the land and the good of the king are one we find like righteous uh uh leadership or sovereignty in the second decan of aries and then in the third uh, that is where uh venus is is the is that in the Chaldean order, Venus is the ruler of the third decan. And, and and you're also correct that in the triplicity model, it's the Sagittarian decan of Aries. Uh, and this is what this is uh seduction, right? In the Rider Waite Smith tarot card, we've got the four 
wands and the two beautiful ladies inviting to the party, right? Like once the king uh, develops his power, how does he extend it? Does he extend it through uh, charisma, right? Through like, oh, look at my spices and and the things and and you know seducing other kingdoms with with one's wealth, right? And and one's uh, uh, resources, but also one's beauty, right? What if those what if those four posts is also enticing into the something that's going to crash on you, right? Arthur is betrayed uh, in in the uh, uh, that particular model of the story, right? Uh, through love, right? Love brings that that vulnerability, um, right, and that capacity for for betrayal. One never knows when we open up into that space of extension through through seduction, right? And through uh, uh, but it is a Venus ruled decan, and art is a huge part of that, right? Art is how we uh, demonstrate our colors to the world, to demonstrate our creative uh, um, vision to the world. And we spoke earlier about how, you know, you were saying that a lot of your personal philosophy, what you feel the world is lacking and what the feel, what you feel the world needs and how this emanates through your, your creative process, right? Through your what the soul wants to say. Uh, what are some of these philosophical and spiritual uh, uh, credos that you espouse through your work? Oh, that's such a loaded question. Um, I think, I think at the end of the day, the biggest thing that is important to me to communicate is that everything one needs in order to experience the highs and lows of life, to experience ecstatic joy, and to gain the wisdom of the depths and the darkness, it's all within oneself. And, you know, growing up in the middle of nowhere where I somehow moved back to I'm back in the middle of nowhere where I started um, because maybe it's a familiar place to me because I know when I'm here that I don't need to look outside of myself for the answer and the answer has always been within and um, the more that I see like our society degrade our culture degrade everything kind of becomes so subsumed by capitalism and Consumerif consumerification, um, I feel like we are drifting from this truth that we need very little and that the answer is not in that, you know, necessarily that workshop that you're seeing on Instagram or whatever. It's within us. And art is such a beautiful way to communicate these universalities because art is a universal medium you know, no matter what you're experiencing or bringing out of you, even if it's a breakup, which is a very specific breakup or a very specific health problem or a very specific loss or joy, everything can be um, grounded down to fundamental truths through art. And that's what makes art interesting to experience, even if you didn't make it, you know, and that's why you seek it to feel soothed or to feel like you're not alone. So, that's for me the most important aspect of making art is to make something that is not only exploring the extremes of um, one's inner or outer world, but also encouraging the listener, encouraging the audience to find that within themselves. Um, because it's kind of like one of those things like with Reiki, it's like people always talk about Reiki and they're like, oh, you know, anyone can learn this. And once you do it on someone, you it would be a shame not to teach them how to do it you know and i kind of feel the same with art with music it's like the things that you're that you're attracted to and what you're listening to and what i'm doing are also within you and so in that way what i do also has always has to have this um this connection to healing in a way i don't know why but i i'm trying to understand why why do i want to help people heal so much in, in making my own art, I think that's why, is I want them to find their own tools to handle what they feel like they're incapable of handling because of um, our, like, world. Our world isn't giving us that that knowledge or that information. 
Man, that is so gorgeous. And and it's crazy because just on the way here, Christopher and I were listening to my teacher talk on this podcast uh, about healing, Freedom Cole. And he's saying, he goes, when you're in a place where the, where the client feels that they need you, you have failed. He's like, we have uh... succeeded when the client finds th- their, the, the source of of what they need inside themselves to heal themselves and to give them what they need. Yeah. And it's like, man, I got chills when you were saying that because it's so um, powerful, you know, and the way that, that see, this is exactly how one example of how magic and art coalesce and are one in the same thing, right? It's a way of communicating this, of, of almost passing a torch, right? With, with what you do as a musician, right? It's like this spiritual work that you do, this this uh, a Buddhist trajectory and the magical and uh, divinatory and astral stuff that you do. It's like when you extend that through art, it's like you're, you're, you're lighting someone else's candle, right? You're, you're, you're giving it to them. You know, it's a it's a beautiful thing. And, and it's like, like they don't need you. Right. They found that thing inside themselves that, that is, uh, you know, if we succeed rather, right. You know, a lot of work I do, I'm like, come on, you're sitting on a gold mine. Use these elections. Like dude, this stuff, the world is so full of magic and it's so great, you know, because it's, uh, you know, and, and it's hard, right? Like, like, even though, um, like as an artist and, and a musician and a magician, like that doesn't mean that your life is free of problems, right? It's, it's, you have your own struggles and, and you share them, you know, like, uh, like uh, you mentioned breakups. I remember going through this breakup and like anytime, you know, the Shangri laws would come on or something. I'd be like, Oh God, this is so my life, you know, and you feel connected to this world outside of you, even if it is sorrow, you know, and, and you've been going through some rough transits lately and stuff like this, right? How have you been navigating these with your practice and, and your creativity? All those transits? Of, <laughs> yeah. Oh, I mean, it's been, it's actually been a blessing. I think really hard transits, transits are a blessing, even though they're brutal, brutal. Uh, you know, I think no matter what you you know constantly going through this hero's journey um answering the call and understanding that like maybe who you were in the past wasn't the best version of yourself that you can be just to say it simply you know um so yeah i have been going through some some rough astrological transits right now but they've been actually this huge blessing because they constantly it constantly reminds me that I'm not done yet. I'm not done growing. I'm not done evolving. I'm not done um doing the work. Uh and like having to really do the work, you know, you can't just say you're doing it. You actually have to do it. Otherwise you're gonna get um buried in quicksand. So um it's been really hard, but I think taking time to just slow down, really understand my priorities, really understand you know, who I am, dissolving identities that are out outmoded, dissolving the ego. I mean, I've gone through so many ego deaths at this point. <laughs> even just putting makeup on. I'm like, what am I doing? Why am I even putting this makeup on? It's a waste of time. <laughs> I can't do it anymore. I can't. Um, but it's, you know, it's interesting too, because I have a music career that I've had now for like, what, 14, 15, I don't know, 12, I don't know how long, since 2008. Um, and it's been an identity and, um, that identity is since uh, it's, it's evolving and changing and my interests are changing. It's, you know, I see my peers on tour and I'm like, oh, I can't do that again, man. I can't, I can't do that again. (laughs) You know, there's just things that used to fire me up that no longer fire me up that it would just feel like retreading ground that I've already covered. And so, that's where I'm, that's my personal journey. Everyone's journey is different, but that's where I'm at right now where I'm having to go. Number one, who am I? Who am I when the mask is off? What, you know, and what am I, what am I made for? Um, And what am I meant for? What, what is it about what I do that is actually important? And what is it about what I do that was trying to fit in or trying to people please or trying to be amiable or amicable 
Um, and um, so that, but the, you know, there's going to be a long process where you just don't know. And that's where I'm, that's where I've been. I'm moving through it. But I was like, I don't know. And so I'm not going to do anything right now because I need to, I need to really sit with how I feel and where I'm going and not just react out of fear, um, which is probably the easy thing to do. Yeah. And you're going through, you got Rahu eclipses on your natal sun and K2 eclipses on your natal ascendant, right? So it's like, Whoa, I mean, that is a double, uh, <laughs> yeah. let's just say, disorienting time, right? Um, yeah. But you're not doing nothing. As I understand, you're scoring a film right now. Is that correct? Yep. I am scoring a film and I'm in talks to do it yet another one after that. So um, I'm transitioning in a way that feels totally natural and totally right. And my passion for what I'm doing right now is just through the roof. Like I can't stop. I'm just, I can't stop, you know? And so times like that, when you feel like you don't know who you are, you don't know what's going on, you feel disoriented, you know, just follow the things that feel right because that's the only way through. And so I'm, I'm making I'm making changes, but they're necessary changes. Yeah, and it actually it's like transit appropriate because you know one of the significations of Rahu is cinema. Really? Yeah, yeah. Because oh. if you think about Rahu, like Rahu is our attachments to the material world, right? We're all kind of born in a sense, uh, right? Because of our attachments to the material world. You know, if a, my Param Guruji once said, if a baby is say there's a pregnant woman and there's a chance that the baby might die right it not it might not come into the world you pray to rahu right the vishnu avatar of rahu is is varaha the boar who like brings like nature like onto the land like brings us into mm -hmm. this world and therefore um naturally there's uh, uh rahu is a malefic graha right so we get this uh this delirium right and we can get over attachment and addiction and crime and transgression and trauma with rahu and all this stuff but we can also get innovation right and and in your uh uh, sidereal chart you got rahu in his own sign there right rahu and aquarius and you know this is where we get more of like a, a nikolai tesla kind of energy right and not like a manuel noriega kind of energy that yeah. rahu can <laughs> can sometimes signify right um but yeah because uh we're born into this world of matter that is in a sense a play a movie, as we discussed earlier, it is a simulation, right? Rahu uh, creates simulations and, and cinema is one of the, like, come on, you know, I mean, we sit down for two hours and tacitly agree that we're going to pretend something is real. That's not real. Mm -hmm. You know, every time we watch a movie, you know, and I'm, I'm a big cinema aficionado myself so it's yeah. it's it's there's something so magical about movies right it might be well gosh music and movies are neck and neck for the most magical art form i feel like you know um what can you tell us as much as you can i'm sure uh th there might be limits around this but can you tell us about the project a little bit and how this mm -hmm. new uh form of expression is is satisfying and how it's tapping into new kind of like uh maneuvers and and ways of of conveying the muse if you like oh i couldn't have come at a better time because i was really struggling um the past couple of years with songwriting um feeling extremely stuck in a mode of writing music that was not serving me and i wasn't enjoying the process anymore and i mean in the nitty-gritty verse chorus, verse chorus, bridge chorus, and like very specific key changes and key signatures and um, everything. Like I felt so stuck. And um, when this opportunity came, it was like a breath of fresh air. And um, the, uh, the director and the lead in the movie um, both fought for me. Like it took a couple years to get from point A to point B where I am now scoring the entire movie. Um, and, but they really fought for me. And so here I have this opportunity to prove myself in a new way and also have to um, respond to an image 
that does not need a verse or a chorus or a bridge. <laughs> like they don't they don't need they don't need that. And so I was finally able to unleash myself from that burden of form. And um it's just been like floodgates opening and you know, I'm I'm at the computer, I'm watching the, the cues and I'm like, I can't do this, I can't do this, I don't know. I have crazy imposter syndrome. And then I pick up a viola and I'm like teaching myself how to play viola just to get the sound out because I have the sound in my head. And, you know, and so every step of the way I've had to go, I can do this. I can do this. And um, I am doing it. And uh, that's been really helpful for me because I felt so held back in the past by what I felt like my limitations were, whether they were my own um, my own sense of limits of what I felt like I was capable of or what I thought people wanted from me. I mean, also, I started doing a, a like a harsh noise project called Nika um, and playing some shows. And uh, that's been a huge healing process for me to be like, I, I need to write songs. Why did I think I need to write songs all the time? Um, I don't even want to write the songs, you know, so it's it's been an incredible, incredible journey. But it's not for lack of of tears and confusion and frustration. Man, that's so great. It's like you're getting both ends of the scale, right? You're getting this like like cinematic uh like, you know, yes, wrong in a sense, but also Libra, right? This is a very aesthetic expression of you and then you're getting this like Mars ruled harsh noise situation going at the same time. So it sounds to me like your uh your spiritual uh and magical practices and explorations around these transits have actually been pretty positive, you know, and, and it sounds like, uh, honestly, I also think it's a relief for me and probably to some of the people listening that, you know, somebody as accomplished as you and somebody as talented as you are, you know, might still struggle with something like imposter syndrome, right. Or might still struggle against what they believe their, um, uh, uh, limits of potential might be and what they believe there, you know, that you have moments like, I can't do it. I can't do it. You know, it's, it's super refreshing. It's like, you know, like we were saying earlier, we live in this kind of Instagram world where everybody's showing themselves at their best and at their most okay. successful and at the, the top of their, their game, you know, and, you know, in the best shape and the best lighting and the best everything. And, and no one really shares like, the struggle, you know, and it gives people this, I think, distorted lens of, of what life is really like, you know, and, and, and mm -hmm. if we want to keep going with this cinematic metaphor, like, you know, who's going to go see the movie if there's not a conflict, you know, who's going to go see the movie if there's not a struggle or a heartbreak or anything like that. It is these, these trials that life presents us with that make it that's where the drama comes in, you know, and, and, and that's where kind of the, the meaning comes in, you know? So it's, it's really beautiful that you're extending this onto, you know, a cinematic realm of somebody else's story, right. Or, or somebody else's, uh, um, experience and how that's, it seems like it's really been bringing different stuff out of you, huh? Oh yeah. Yeah. It's been, it's been a, a godsend, honestly, in terms of getting through this <laughs> this time. Um, it's just given me a a vehicle to really break out of the the things that I was struggling with for so long. I mean, again, like it's been extremely scary and daunting and intimidating, um, but at the same time, it really allowed me to see what I'm capable of. So, whew, I needed it. <laughs> yeah, and my friend. Um jg thurwell who actually i kind of like low-key paired yeah. you up with a while back at the guggenheim i remember uh oh really yeah chris cody texted me like late at night one night when i was at my drafting table like working on drawings at an exhibition coming up and chris is like do you know anybody who is good at like for conducting an orchestra and i just was like texting him back i was like i don't know jg thorwell and he goes perfect and then i see jg at a party a couple weeks later he's like oh he goes i'm 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 like hey what's up and he goes uh, i'm gonna be doing this uh uh orchestral uh you know conducted with uh 
uh, Zola Jesus at the Guggenheim. I was like, wait, did Chris Cody hook you up with this? And he goes, yeah, he did. I was like, dude, that was me. I totally like, <laughs> so, you know, cause- you never told me that. That's crazy. Because I remember hitting Chris up and being like, and asking him that. I had no idea he, he asked you. Oh, really? I thought you that's- knew that by now. Uh, no. Oh, that's so <laughs> funny. Yeah. yeah. I remember just like rolling that's my eyes awesome. and be like, man, I'm all like, the man behind the curtain, right? Like I like, you know, but I was like, cause, love it. cause I knew I you, but Chris didn't tell me that it was about you. Uh, he just was who conducts orchestras and JG has this awesome project called the steroid Maximus. And I'd seen him conduct down in prospect park, this entire orchestra, uh, you know, sort of prior ish to when Chris texted me and I was like, JG throw well. And then I see JG. He's like, Oh, I'm working with Zilla Jesus. I'm like, bro, I like, I, I fucking set that up kind of. <laughs> that know? was the best idea. I'm so glad you put JG in his head because I, I was, I've always been such a huge fan of his work since I was, you know, since I was a kid and being able to work with him was amazing. And also, wow, is that dude the best ever? Like, that is one of the best guys. <laughs> it's crazy. Not to like go off of a JG, but to this day, he's still, I'll be playing in New York and after the show, I'll be out and he, he walks right. I'm like, JG, you were at, he's at every show. He's always supportive. He's just like the sweetest guy and the hardest worker and loves, truly loves music. Like I just can't say enough good things about that guy. Definitely. I mean, talk about integrity. You know, that guy has been around uh, for so long and has always evolved, right? He's always doing new things, right? He's got this, he's got this awesome chamber orchestra project too. Manorexia, it's called. Man, I I love Manorexia. That's honestly, that might be my favorite thing JG does. It's this beautiful, like, four or five piece chamber stuff that he conducts and it's so gorgeous and uh, uh steroid maximus so i thought of him when chris asked me for you I, I i was at the guggenheim thing it was fantastic of course Thank you. um but it's so funny that it never you know but that's what i love about scenes like and universes like ours it's like everybody knows each other in a way and everybody has each other's back, you know, like everybody wants to like support and connect and be like, I know what it's, I know how hard it is to be an artist. I know how hard it is to do this. Like, you know, like uh, uh, I think we're lucky, you know, that we live in this universe, like sacred bones uh, very much creates that atmosphere. I think of like, you know, strong community and, and friendship and stuff like that. Um, but JG, uh, one of his evolutions is that he does a lot of scoring now. He does for many years now. He's done the scoring for that show, Venture Brothers, and he also Perfect. does um, Archer now. That that other animated series, um, and I, I, it's interesting. And and you posted about this recently. How scoring for movies and and stuff it, it has often been kind of like a male dominated uh, arena, right? So is that sort of okay. another layer with which you're uh, coming forth with this, you know, uh, new field that you're entering? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And it's it was kind of shocking. I mean, I haven't even begun to scratch the surface of that, but. Um, there was a lot of hesitancy by the producers of the film that I'm working on to give me a shot. And I think a lot of it had to do that I was a, a female musician. Um, and so they had, they got this other guy who, you know, has experience, but, um, you know, and, and I just, exp- and at the same time, I feel like it took a female filmmaker to fight for me because she literally had to fight tooth and nail to have me on the project. Um, and I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful for Italian women, Italian Aries women. <laughs> Mitzi, I love you. Uh, she's amazing. But, um, you know, because it, I, you know, I had been seeing my peers, my male peers be get, getting gigs left and right getting TV shows, getting video games, getting movies. And they're just like, it's like they can't, I I felt like, oh my God, they're just, they're saying, they're probably having to say no to so much. Like no one's coming to me. And I feel like I've gone out of my way to make it clear as a musician that what I do is so deeply rooted in in cinema and and, um, film music and stuff like that. And so it really, I really started to get frustrated by it. And then seeing that, okay, it took a female filmmaker to have interest in me. 
And then once that happened, two other filmmakers wanted, you know, have, have had interest, but they're both fe- all, all, all women, all women, you know, and I'm grateful for that. I'm so grateful that I have women that are advocating for me. But at the same time, I'm like, wow, now I'm seeing that it takes women wanting to work with women in order to make these <laughs> make these gigs happen. Um, because all of my male peers are working with these male directors so easily, so quickly, like effortlessly, seemingly. And um, and that's not lost on me. And so now I'm like, oh, man, this is going to be another uphill battle <laughs> in, uh, in, in, in a different um, genre or type of music. Why do you think it was such a struggle for them? Like, why did it have to be a fight to get you on it? I mean, there's a lot of things I think, well, people don't see what I'm capable of as a, as a producer or composer. Um, and I mean, it took me a long time and it took me as a whole other saga is that it took me 10 years of going, I'm doing this all myself and having to anyone, any male that was in a room with me, I had to like elbow out um, because I was so afraid of them having the credit and now I don't have an ego about it, but at that time I needed to prove that I was capable of of doing X, Y, and Z because people just assumed I was the singer in a band. Um, and when I worked with JG, I was, um, at that point I was very young. I was like 23 or something and I still was very much trying to prove myself. And so poor JG was just there trying to make magic happen. And I was getting a little combative with him <laughs> because I felt like, oh, is another guy telling me what to do, even though it's JG fucking Thurwell. Um, and, uh, and he was just so, so beautiful about it. But, um, but I really had to struggle to define myself as an artist um, in a field where, you know, some people won't even listen to me because I'm a woman, you know, like a lot of people come up to me and they're like, yeah, you're pretty good for like a, a female musician or you're, you know, I don't usually listen to like women, but like, you know, you're kind of, you're cool or whatever, where it's like, I'm already like stuck in a genre just by being born a woman. And so now I have, now I'm seeing how that is magnified and amplified in the film music world. Yeah. Like film is so bro I mean, like music is bro but like Super. Fil- film is like even worse, right? Yeah. It's very broy, and it's and I'm really starting to see the um, the dirtiness, the grossness behind the scenes of stuff like that, uh, and so that's going to be really hard for me <laughs> because I don't uh, I don't do kindly to that kind of stuff. Um, it's really hard for me to keep my mouth shut, but um, <laughs> but at the same time, it's something I really am so passionate about pursuing, and so. I'm just grateful that um, there are women out there who are, you know, like I, I made a post about Hildur Gunna Dottir, who is, a, I've always been a huge fan of her work. She's this amazing cellist, composer. But um, she worked with Johan Johansson for many, many years and never got the credit. And then once Johan passed, Hildur started getting some offers. And now she's just, she's won Oscars and I think she's won a Grammy. She's just done incredible work she did chernobyl the joker all this stuff and so i'm really grateful for women like her who are working with male directors and hopefully are setting they, she seems to be setting a good example um and breaking that breaking that barrier but uh it's it's real it's real damn well that son at makarka is is coming out right this like leadership and this like like uh demonstration of, of power and identity and and yeah. all this stuff right in the in, in a field where there's a lot of opposition to it and also you know and that that lust card right it's so great that um uh, you know even in the writer weight smith uh, talk about a woman who's been kind of sp- uh, shelved into the shadows, right? For years, we called the right of weight deck the right of weight, and nobody gave Pamela yeah. Coleman Smith the credit for creating the images on that deck that are, come on, I mean, so iconic. I, I would call them the most like iconic tarot imagery mm-hmm. we've got, you know, and it's Pamela Coleman Sw- Smith. And, uh, I, you know, I was lucky Artnet actually, I think, I think it was Artnet, yeah, like a couple of years ago was like asking me about that, like, you know, like how an artist, it's like, yeah, it's like both occultism and female artists are two things that the world just doesn't like want to see for some reason you know it's like they just don't 
still to this day, you know, we think that we're so enlightened. And as you say, we got all this manifestation Instagram workshops and stuff, but like real the real deal occultism, right? And and real deal yeah. art, you know, we think like, oh yeah, it's like, look, we have all these women, you know, ballers and and this, that, and the other. But it's like, yeah, but that doesn't mean that there's still not a struggle. There's almost this like systemic bias, as you say, against like, which I don't know why. I mean, you posted that thing like where the guy was like, uh, I, I don't know exactly who it was, but he said he wanted this woman to yeah. score the project. And the guys in the room were like, no, nah, this one has to rock. Yeah. And he's like, what do you mean? Like women can't rock? Like, like what women only make like gentle music or something? Yeah. That was the- that was shocking to me, but it was so indicative. I was like, I needed to post this because it, my jaw dropped. But at the same time, I was like, this is that's it. That's what that's it. That's the truth. That's the truth. Yeah, it's like there's something, you know, we've got these biases as human beings that we can't seem to get past, you know, and that's, you know, Pamela Coleman Smith with those images. It's so interesting how, you know, the strength card or the lust card, it has this, it's a woman holding the, the jaws of a lion, right? Or in the sense of the, the Crowley Thoth deck, which was also illustrated by a woman, Lady Frida Harris, right? Did yeah. the did the art for, for the Crowley Thoth deck is, you know, Crowley Harris, I suppose, is what people are starting to call it now. But, you know, in that sense, it's it's Babylon, right? Like riding on the seven-headed Prefer. beast. And that card is indicative, really, of the astrological sign of Leo, right? Which is this royal and and kingly, like, kind of, you know, this kind of, like, like, royal lineage, but also, like, Elvis Presley, right? Like, rock star kind of situation. And it's there. And, and the iconography of this card is always female, you know? It's always, okay. they're like, oh, hey, look, there's this fierce beast. And it is, and it is this, uh, uh, this female that is holding its jaws with total equipoise, right? And total ease. And so... Uh, I can tell you who the fierce beast is. <laughs> who's the fierce beast? The man! It's the man! <laughs> <laughs> I know. I, it's like the same thing. Like, like you know, genuine esotericism, like academic, journalistic, media stuff. It always has to be something scary or it has to be something for weirdos. You know, it's never something like authentic. And and the same thing mm -hmm. with, with women. It's like, oh, sure. Uh, they serve this purpose. They, they have certain they have a certain skill set and capacity. But it's like, what do you mean? You know, why does it have to be uh, divided that yeah. way? The, the crazy thing about that, as I've been thinking about motherhood a lot as I'm getting older and thinking about what it what it does to the body and what you have one has to go through as a um, as a, you know, someone giving birth. Wow. OK, if you if, if, like if child if childbirth isn't the most metal thing that like anyone will ever go through, I don't know what is, you know, and to just discount the um, the deep, profound great damp mother earth freaking primal energy that is within a, every woman or or um you know it's like it's it's so mind-boggling to be so ignorant about how much strength and how much ferocity and how much intensity and how much creative energy is in is in um women and it's yeah it's a shame it's a shame but i'm not I'm not going to go quietly into the delicate music of <laughs> of womanhood, of supposed womanhood. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't expect that you would ever, you know, it's like, that's, that's the thing. Motherhood is a heroic act. It's an act of tremendous pain and tremendous, like, yeah. like, rah, like, like agony and, and pushing through. Right. And then also sacrificing oneself for the life of another, you know? And I mean, yeah. in many, like, <laughs> I would say it's only fairly recent that, that, um, uh, that the likelihood of a woman surviving the birth of a child was even yeah. likely, you know? I mean, that's, that, that's, there's a bit of novelty to even that phenomenon, you know, it, it is a totally heroic act and I don't know what it is. I mean, maybe it's conditioning through this sort of I don't know, Virgin Mary kind of uh, uh, idealization that people only want this this gentle image of motherhood or this kind of like, you know, sensitive and and, you know, down comforter image of motherhood while while not not 
absorbing the the pain and the 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 intensity and the strength that is required in something that we are all here because of <laughs> you know mm-hmm. and yeah. and it's it's yeah I, I can't imagine you know professional circles the way you know people women have babies and all of a sudden there's this like irrelevance that they have to deal with i mean it's so messed up yeah, it's really scary. I would love to be a dad. I'll just put that out there. I th- I think I'd make a great dad. <laughs> like, <laughs> it seems like da- it seems super chill. It seems awesome to be a dad because you get the kid, but you don't get all the baggage. Like, I would love that, you know. But um, but alas, you know, I have to make this decision fairly soon, and so it's it's something that one thinks about, and also you know when I think about what it means to be a woman and what, you know, what that duty is and also what that entails. It's pretty hardcore. So, so don't tell me that I'm not strong enough to make a film score. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) I'm I'm good. You know, it makes me so proud. Like, I don't know, just that, like, I've, I've known you for so long, you know, and I've seen you do so many different things and evolve through so many, so much stuff. And, and I just feel so, excited you know to to see that you're taking all that that your integrity is still like at the front of the at the helm you know what i mean and you're like nailing this and you're uh it evolving in true form that's true to your atma you know true true to what your soul like like really desires and and with what life brings you and making changes even though there's risk involved and and i would say truly Mm -hmm. having an an evolution as an artist you know i mean you've you're so accomplished you're so gifted and and yet you're always challenging yourself you know and and pushing yourself into realms that are uh that pose difficulties for you you know and that to me that's so heroic you know and and whether you're a mom whether you're scoring films whether you're putting out new records, whatever, I know you're just going to nail it, you know, cause you've got, you got it, man. I mean, you're this, this, the way you infuse spirituality, magic, all this stuff with what you do is, is really taps into this core integrity, you know, and, and this core yeah. truth. And I am so stoked to see what you do with those movies and, and so stoked to see, uh, what kind of mom you're going to be if you decide to go that route. Right. And and all this, cause, cause (laughs) you just, you're just unstoppable, you know? Oh, thank you so much, Mickey. That's amazing. And, uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Well, this has been such an honor, you know, and, and such a great way to relaunch the show. Cause it's, I, I really can't think of anyone who who really merges these these uh you know two functions of of art and and magic into something that is really unique and cohesive and and so beautiful. So thank you so much for being a part of this and and for having us and uh thank you for your ongoing inspiration and strength. It's so beautiful, really. Oh, thank you so much. And thank you for providing this education to people when there is a plethora of bad information out there, bad and and, and not cute information. <laughs> it's it's great. And I'm I'm also really happy that you started the Patreon because I remember I would get as your client, I would be getting your moon emails about and you'd be sending out these emails, a newsletter for um if your moon was in, you know, if if the the current moon was in one sign, one's moon sign, that we would get these emails of rituals and things to do, and it's so powerful. I was like, I want them all. I want. I don't care if it's not my moon. And now that you're providing not only the elections, but so much information and um, just knowledge for people, it's it's so important and it's so pure. So thank you. I'm so honored to be here and. Can't wait for what's next for Time Lord. Thank you. Well, we strive for authenticity and what makes it is like, honestly, like the support, like when people are using the elections and using the magic and actually making, putting it into their life, like that's what's so exciting, you know? And uh, man, I cannot, what, do we have a a kind of ballpark figure of when we can expect this movie out for you? 
Um, it should be out later this year, I think. It's called Saint Clair, um, starring Bella Thorne. Uh, it's yeah, it's been so fun to work on. Um, lots, lots of fun. Lots of you know, I'm playing viola. I'm singing. Lots of stuff. Uh, so that should be out later in the year. I'm also working on a record with um my current collaborator Randall Dunn. So we're doing that, and then I may even be going on a piano tour in Europe in the fall. So lots, lots coming. Oh man, that's amazing! I might actually be out in Europe in the fall too, doing a residency. So hopefully, I'll be able to catch one of those. Nice. But it's yes, been so, so great catching up. And honestly, I know you're going through those rough transits, but it sounds like you're nailing this year, and you're really demonstrating so much awesomeness. So. We yeah. will be out watching for you, listening for you, and all that stuff. Thank you so much for joining us, and thank you all for watching and listening. We will see you next thank month you. with more magical love. See you then. Thank you. <laughs>